have a very thought-provoking session lined up titled War and Inflation, the World Economy in the Grip of a Poly Crisis. It is my pleasure to invite on stage Dr. Adam Tooze, Catherine and Shelby Cullum Davis Professor of History and Director of the European Institute at Columbia University. I would also like to request Mr. Suman Berry, Vice Chairman of Niti Ayo Government of India, and Yamini Ayer, President and Chief Executive of CPR, to join us on stage. Thank you, thank you, Prerna. And on behalf of uh, the Center for Policy Research, it's an absolute privilege for me to welcome all of you uh, to our uh, keynote lecture this evening uh, by Professor Adam Tooze uh, with remarks and a conversation with Mr. Suman Berry, Vice Chair of the Niti Aayog. Um, some of you have been with us since the morning. Thank you for bearing with us, and I hope it's been an exciting uh, day for all of you. And we have many new friends who've joined us here. So I'll just uh, uh, bear with me for those of you who've heard all of this in the morning, uh, but I did just for uh, a few minutes want to uh, uh, welcome everybody to the CPR Dialogues and give you a little bit of background. Uh, for, for all of you who've come uh, this evening, the CPR Dialogues is a flag flagship uh, dialogue that we have built uh, over the last uh, three years. We started in 2018. Uh, we had a, a dialogue in March of 2020. Uh, and literally hours after our last guest got onto his flight, thankfully, uh, the world shut down. Thankfully, because it was a bit of a hit and miss. Um, and in these two years, much has changed. Uh, there have been, uh, been significant disruptions, both in how we've thought about old problems like public health, infectious diseases, um, but also new challenges that are confronting us. The climate crisis is accelerating, not decelerating. The Russia-Ukraine war, the consequences of how we dealt with the economy in the midst of the pandemic, too, raise new and important questions about the nature of the, glo of the global economy, the challenge of inflation. And for India, these challenges are crucial because as India emerges from the consequences of the pandemic, not only do we have to think about how to address many of the crucial public service issues that the economy confronted, which led us to, uh, with which we sort of entered into the pandemic, most important public health, social protection, particularly for the urban poor, uh, the challenge of education. We closed schools for two years over these last, uh, over the pandemic, which is only going to accelerate the problem of learning outcomes the challenge of jobs, all of these questions that confront us uh, in the policy world in India uh, have huge implications in how they are, how our addressing them have huge implications in how they are located within the shifting sh uh, contours of the world. Uh, the global economy, the challenge of inflation, the consequences of uh, the disruption caused by Russia, Ukraine. Uh, there is, the old order is most certainly in flux. Arguably, there is no order at this point. Where should India locate herself? And how should the Indian economy strengthen itself in the context of all of this? So today we are asking old questions and new questions, but from very new perspectives, responding to all that we confront. And it's in that context that uh, we've, we pull together this dialogue and deliberation. And I don't think there could be anyone better to help us make sense of all of this and ask questions about India than Professor Adam Tooze. It's an absolute privilege for us at CPR that he agreed to be here. Um, and over the last few days, Adam came to Delhi uh, about four days ago. I've been struck. We've spent some time together. We've been talking about different th aspects of India. We've met a lot of people uh, in Delhi. And I've been struck by how much of an acute listener he is. Um, he's heard different perspectives, different viewpoints, often from different disciplines, people located in different parts of the world of India, uh, got a sense of how argumentative we are, how much we differ, and yet how much we agree. Um, and in all of this, uh, the depth with which he has placed all that he's heard within the comparative context, within the historical context, um, it's a reminder that the many big challenges we confront today, both for us as a nation and our position in the globe, and indeed the globe itself, requires both the ability to listen, listen very carefully, but also the ability to place this within the breadth and depth of the comparative perspective, the historical experience, in order to 
look back to understand the present, but also look forward from recognizing that much of what we confront is not ours alone. It is deeply integrated and deeply embedded in a global context. Um, there is Today, as Adam has, 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 has popularized, the globe is confronting a polycrisis. He pointed in a recent blog that, the, that South Asia is confronting a polycrisis. In a, in a session a few hours ago, we talked about India's role and opportunity in this context of polycrisis. But the only way to make sense of this is through a multidisciplinary lens uh, by looking across the world and looking within ourselves. And this is what I know that we will learn from Adam through the course of his uh, lecture and in the conversation that we will have with Suman uh, as we go through the evening. I did want to just say one last thing about CPR and the dialogues before I hand it over to Adam. I know you're all here to listen to him and Suman and not me. Uh, but uh, I, I wanted to say that um, on behalf of CPR, it's a huge honor and privilege for us to have so many of you here willing to engage, deliberate, and dialogue with us. Um, one of the challenges of uh, being an interlocutor in the world of policy is that we spend a fair amount of time in the corridors of power engaging with those that are designing and shaping policy. We do also make an effort at CPR in particular to spend as much time as we can uh, to understand perspectives on the grassroots, to observe and understand how policy translates into action on the ground and how it impacts people's lives. But in all of this, uh, we must also remember that good policy comes from deep deliberation, engagement, and critique. And spaces like this have been crafted and carved by us precisely to ensure that we can engage in a public discussion, in a public dialogue. Much of the questions that we are discussing over these next two, or yet this today and the questions that we will discuss over tomorrow, uh, remind us that so much that we know is actually up for deep contestation. And the only way that India, and in fact the globe, can resolve the deep uncertainties it confronts today is through deliberation, dialogue, and building new public consensus. This is in many ways the heart of democracy and the heart of what we strive to do at CPR, building a public, inclusive imagination of what policymaking is. So thank you, all of you, for making the effort to be here, to engage with us, to be part of this process, and to also make us feel that there is some value in this process. It's, it's really heartening to see so many friends, old and new, and family of CPR here, part of this, uh, this effort that, that, that we've undergone gone, and I'm looking forward to your critique, your questions, and your scrutiny. There can't be a better way to engage with an institution than with the ideas and, uh, and the issues that it works on. Thank you, and looking forward to a wonderful evening. Adam, over to you. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Well, well thank you so much, Yamini, for that wonderful introduction, and may I just, re may I just return the thanks. I, I, uh, I've had an absolutely extraordinary time here, um, and, and the depth of engagement and conversation that I've been able to sustain with you and the entire team at CPR and the doors that you have opened for me have been a really unforgettable, unique in my, in my career, unique experience. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Suman Berry for, for turning out tonight and being willing to engage um, with, with some of the ideas that I'm going to put up for you this evening. I mean, it's a real privilege to be able to entertain a conversation about uh, Indian and global affairs uh, at, at such a high level, as, as a rank outsider, and let's be frank about this, a complete outsider. Um, we heard this morning uh, that the CPR um, is arguably, uh, well, it, the claim was it's the best think tank in the world, and I'm actually going to endorse that, um, happily endorse that. I, I cannot remember a time when I've had as many just absolutely flat-out excellent conversations <laughs> intense, relentless, all day long, in all sorts of settings, taxis, seminar rooms, over coffee, absolutely relentlessly, for days and days and days. And it is, it's frankly humbling. I mean, today we've been on this itinerary that went from, you know, unlivable but emancipatory cities to the experience of school children sleeping on their father's grocery carts to um, extraordinary overviews of world affairs to the pricing of protein in the Indian diet. Um, and it's just been a, a relentless series. The, the significance of the 1977 election in, in the history of democracy in the world um, it's been an absolutely relentless feast. Um, and my task, 
rather hubristically is to somehow set all of this against the global backdrop. I mean, that's the, the little job that I have to do this evening. Um, at least you could say there's an occasion for this task, which is that, of course, India will be chairing the G20 next year, and we'll be having a panel specifically on that topic uh, tomorrow. Now, I think one important illusion to dispel is that there's any one uncontentious way of doing this global thing that we wield into a room like this, right? Um, I think that's one of the pitfalls of quite a lot of kind of globalese thinking, that we kind of assume that we know from the start what it is that we ought to be talking about. In fact, every framing, down to the tone of your voice in the which you deliver that framing, is a choice. It's a choice about how you are going to position yourself um, in the world and you're thinking about the world and the moment that we are in. And I have a very hard act to follow in this respect because at lunch, uh, we had the privilege of listening to Shivanka uh, Menon, one of the great figures of um, Indian diplomacy and Indian foreign affairs, a legendary figure indeed, extremely urbane, charismatic, his entire message was one of calm, a plea for negotiation, for reason, for frankness, for speaking clearly with potential enemies and those of different opinion to reach agreement. Um, and I think the question that, to my mind, came to my mind is why was he framing it? Why was he framing the situation that way? And then in the Q&A, which was extensive that followed, very well moderated, fascinating exchange, it became clear, I think, why his presentation had the character that it did. Because the point in this almost sort of stainless steel presentation of the present day, glossy, clean, hard though in a sense, was to defend the role of diplomacy at the current moment, to defend the role of professional management of foreign affairs in the troubled, polarized political times that we inhabit. So it was an image of the world that he delivered to us for, fit for a certain purpose, for the purpose of justifying the business of diplomacy. It was a tool, it was a razor with a certain edge. But then in that conversation, at one moment towards the end, I asked him a sort of meta question about the history of diplomacy. All of a sudden, he showed us the other side of this. And he looked me in the eyes, and I don't know whether this is a diplomat's trick, but it was very, very effective. He looked at me and he said, Adam, I think you and I have in common that we smile in the face of catastrophe. And it's such a striking phrase. I can't, I can't quite believe he actually said it to me, but I'm certain that I heard him say, you and I have in common that we smile in the face of catastrophe. And all of a sudden you think, well, what was that other presentation you gave us about the world a second ago where we were smiling the whole time? Was this smiling in the face of, of catastrophe? Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to make it my job this evening to give you the catastrophe. I'm going to give you that other side, the non glossy, the non-diplomatic version of our current moment. And with a purpose as well. The, the point here of this rather one-sided, overly dramatic, very focused, very contemporary account is to argue that alongside diplomacy, which we absolutely need, we also need action. We need decision. We need policy. We need political choices of a serious kind. This, we are not going to be able to manage this situation with diplomacy alone. Assumptions about the self-interest of states, straightforward, ahistorical, realist logic is not going to see us through. We face a crisis more intense than that. And to face that, I think we need to face the urgency of our moment. And for somebody like myself, whose time has basically in his head has been torn schizophrenically all week between you know, the logic of the digitization of the Indian welfare system on the one hand, and on the other hand, what's going on in the UK, which as you can hear is the country I have the passport, misfortune to have the passport of, has been tearing me apart in a sense, because around the clock what you're trying to monitor is the movement in bond markets. And if you want something that moves urgently, it's global bond markets. They move like a pandemic. Hours, days matter in bond market affairs. It's, I think, going to be shown by historians that earlier this week, the British sovereign debt market came within hours of total collapse. We saw huge sell-offs at the long end. I mean, the numbers you wouldn't believe. We're talking sub-junk. We're talking 80% discounts on some British debt. You could make 147% returns over lunch when the Bank of England stepped in. We're talking a truly catastrophic development. And what is even more remarkable is the tremor this appears to have unleashed in the US Treasury market, because if you think the gilt market is big at one and a half trillion pounds, 
The US Treasury market is a $24 trillion monster. It is the foundation of the global financial system. It is what shook action loose in March 2020. I'll say much more about that. In, well, I'll glance at it later on in my talk today. But that sense of urgency is something that I think we also need to have in the room to appreciate the circumstances that we're in. But let me just stand back a bit and try and give you the bigger point that I want to make. And my bigger point is simply that in this moment, we are in the middle of a process still unfolding and uncompleted, now going on for about 15 years, of up upheaving, dislocation, rearrangement of the global economy, global geopolitics, and politics. You could take this further down up to the level of subjectivity and identity, but that's beyond my, my reach this evening. That will rank with these other episodes in world history all the way back to the late 19th century. It's up there, I think, at that scale. We at least, I think, need to wrap our heads, the around, our heads around the possibility that that is what we are experiencing. And we should not close our minds to the possibility that that is the scale. Now, don't worry, I'm not going to take you through the history of the world since the 1870s and prove this point by a series of comparisons. I am just going to focus very tightly on this phase um, since uh, the beginning of this crisis. But that's the basic claim. And, and that has significance for India at the moment at which you assume the chair role in relation to the G20. That's the challenge I think you're up against. Now, we could date the onset of this moment, I think, as using a kind of combination of techniques of the historian and anthropologist. You know, anthropologists will go into complex cultures they don't really understand and try and figure out their logic. Well, take yourself back to 2007 and imagine you're a Swiss business journalist uh, uh, interviewing Alan Greenspan. And you ask him how he's going to vote in the upcoming American presidential election, and he tells you this, doesn't matter how I vote. It doesn't matter how I vote in the American presidential election because the world is ruled by market forces. And I put your anthropologist hat on and go, the amazing thing about this is no one laughed when he said it. Because now, if he said this now, we'd all laugh. Because this doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to say that it doesn't matter which way you vote in an American presidential election and the world is ruled by market forces. And furthermore, that's a good thing, which he says in this quote here. We're fortunate that the world, it's, it's almost incomprehensibly at odds with our reality. So this was the fall of 2007 and that is the world that we have lost. And we are now in a world beyond that point. And that other world begins in 2008, I would submit, and it, of course, begins with the financial crisis, which I've written and many other people in this room have written extensively about, but not just the financial crisis of 2008. We are also doing, dealing in 2008 now with the failure of the WTO Doha round uh, and with the vast disappointment of the Copenhagen climate talks in 2009, where it almost shattered the COP regime, and the stage was set for the move to Paris on a very different basis in 2015. It is also the moment, of course, where NATO expansion talk triggers Russia into its first punitive military uh, defense or effort to roll back the world. And it is also, and it's somehow slipped from memory, the moment of the swine flu panic. In other words, the full complex of war, pandemic, financial crisis, uh, and globalization in question that we might think of as being rather more present moment was already fully present in this 2008-9 moment. After which I think there followed a kind of period of false calm. It was into that period of false calm. I remember taking it very seriously because as a historian, I naively imagined I could set about writing a history of 2008 in this moment of false calm framed by Mario Draghi's whatever it takes and by the re-election of Barack Obama at that moment. It felt like the wheels were back on the liberal centrist bus at that point. And so we could begin to look back at 2008 and tell its history as though it was past history. And we know, of course, that this was a complete illusion, that the wheels were just only a beginning to come off the order. And by 2014, especially if you're European, you, <coughs> your sense of the world is unhinging completely. You have the Ukraine crisis 1.0, you have the Syrian refugee crisis, the West Asian crisis spilling over into Europe. You have the Eurozone crisis fundamentally shaking and risking the, co the coherence of the EU project. And of course, then in 16, we roll, we roll around to the populist shock. And it's not for nothing that at that moment, Jean-Claude Juncker, picking up on complexity theory from the 1970s, coins this notion that Europe is suffering a polycrisis that I've subsequently tried to use as a, as a frame for thinking a global order. Again, the point is this polycrisis notion is not specific to our current moment. It originates at an earlier moment, and in fact, it has an intellectual legacy that goes all the way back to the 1970s, if you wanted to trace it. 
And we started 2020, if you were at any of the kind of usual global gatherings um, uh, uh, in, 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 in 2020, beginning of that year, notoriously, of course, at Davos, you were worrying about populism, about trade wars, about Trump and Xi. And then, of course, by January, we found ourselves in a very different world altogether. And we found ourselves in a world, you know, to, as it were, riff rather unfairly on Volcker, sorry, on Greenspan, in which, as it were, the world appeared to be governed not by market forces, but simply by the world. In other words, nature was imposing itself on us or our political reaction to nature and its demands. An epidemic which sweeping around the world has now caused 18 million excess deaths, a true catastrophe of global public health, which we're still struggling with today. And it's not a surprise. It should never have taken us by surprise. We had reason to expect this. This was part of a history which we were already writing. We just somehow had refused to take it as seriously as we should have. As long as we have had a diagnosis of climate change, in other words, back to the early 1970s, we have had a prediction of new infectious diseases that would come and rampage through the human society. We have to accept this as part of the anthropocenic condition. This is not an accidental fact of the, of the world. In the early 2000s, it was bird flu, before it was swine flu, and then it was Ebola, and of course in the 1980s it was AIDS, HIV, but that, because of its mode of transmission, constituted a different type of threat. We had known that this was gonna cost us when this thing arrived. This is a Larry Summers paper from 2018. Larry Summers is an incredibly capacious thinker. He was on the pandemic issue. He was on it in the entirely wrong way because like most analysts, he assumed the damage will be done in low income and emerging market economies. Whereas in fact, what happened is this. This is the largest single interruption in economic activity we have ever had in recorded history. This is a 20% fall in global GDP in a matter of weeks. Now, in the Great Depression, we get to a 20% fall in the worst hit economies over a matter of years. 20% deflection in GDP is a completely unheard of shock. It happened in a matter of weeks. In fact, we had to invent new data sets to track it, which are these daily, weekly adjusted numbers that Goldman Sachs put out. If you were going to draw a, a graph of the world's economic development freehand from World War II onwards, it would look like this. That's COVID. Right? That's the biggest deflection you're ever going to see. Of course, this is a totally amateurish thing. These graphs are done on the basis of annual data. I've just free-handed in a monthly shock. Um, but that's the scale of the shock in relation to that graph, just to give you an idea of how big and massive this was. And to weather that shock in the financial system, we then did extraordinarily radical things. Right? I mean, we're used to thinking the age of unconventional monetary policy starts in 2008, but we ain't even gotten started in 2008, right? QE, or rather this isn't QE because this is financial stabilization. It's not really about macroeconomic governance. It's about managing the global bond markets. But the scale of the interventions that were necessary at that point, the Fed is buying bonds per day at the rate it was buying them per month in 2008, in late March. It buys a trillion dollars in a matter of weeks. It just sucks huge slice of the American bond market out of circulation to stabilize the world. There is an incredible urgency to this. It's a matter of panic. There's very little choice in the matter. You have to do it, otherwise the bond market dies. But on the other hand, it also inspires fantasies of a kind of voluntarist variety. I mean, if we can do this, there's really practically nothing we can't do. And for many of us in the aftermath, the question really became, the urgent question was, what is the politics of this? Now, in my book, Shutdown, on this crisis, I make the rather contrarian argument against my leftist friends that we shouldn't misunderstand this as a liberatory left Keynesian moment. We should understand it for what it was, which was the most radical act of Bismarckian conservatism ever. In other words, everything has to change so that everything remains the same which is, I think, the scale of resource that was mobilized. But not for nothing, many of us began to riff very extensively from 2020 onwards on this marvelous line from John Maynard Keynes, which is that anything we can actually do, we can afford. There really is, the financing constraint is an illusion. The reality of the economy is what matters, what you can organize, what you can pol collectively, politically agree to do. This is what matters. The question is, is what we are able and willing actually to do. After that, the financing is a technicality. And the scale of that financing can be done on the kind of orders of magnitude that we saw in relation to the bond market and central bank action. The real issue is the real economic constraints. And that was on the one hand emancipatory because it means you can kill the financing argument as a serious conversation. And you see that echoing all the way through. I mean, folks here will have had other things to worry about, but the German government in the last 24 hours allocated 5% of GDP to an energy subsidy program. 
5% of GDP to an energy subsidy program. That's two weeks after the British government did the same thing. Now, just imagine the IMF's reaction to your average emerging market economy deciding to allocate 5% of GDP to a fossil fuel subsidy with practically no deliberation. But that comes out of this same spirit. We can finance it. The question is, can we organize it and do it, right? It comes out of this moment. So we plunged billions into warp speed vaccine development and triumphed. We got not just one vaccine, but a whole suite. And then, and this is the flip side of the Keynesian argument coming home to bite, could we actually distribute them to the world's population? No, we couldn't, nor did we want to, nor was there any commitment to doing so. So I've got four in my arm, and a third of the world's population has none, which exposes us all to risk. And we all know the insane, short-sighted irrationality of this, because these are trillions of dollars of notes lying on the pavement, if you believe the IMF, because clearly there is a huge risk here that we're all undertaking by not engaging. It's a truly, it's a true Keynesian muddle, a failure of collective action of the most crass kind. I don't believe it can be explained simply through the narrow-mindedness of Western pharmaceutical companies, because we'd simply buy them out if it was a matter of that. Like, how much does it cost to get this stuff? We could settle this. Already in 2021, the limits of this Keynesian exorbitant enthusiasm for action were clear also in another market, which is the energy market. It suddenly emerged that there isn't such a thing as a global gas market. And when the unevenness of the world's recovery makes itself felt in 2021, it makes a huge difference whether Russian gas can go to China or not. It can't, because all the pipelines run west. So the Chinese end up dipping into the LNG market, blowing the LNG market up, and the Europeans find themselves, by the fall of 2021, already in trouble, along with all the emerging market economies which have been lured into LNG over the previous years. That dysfunction is not a function of Putin's war. It started already last year. We may control money, but already in 2021, we were seeing macroscopic climate shocks to the world economy, which this year, of course, have intensified in a really dramatic way in the near total hiatus of the Chinese hydro system, for instance, which is compounding problems in those energy markets. So again and again, we're, as it were, oscillating between the voluntarist capacity to do certain sorts of financial and economic actions, which was stimulated in 2020, and by this series of humbling realizations of constraint on the other side, uh, which become more and more crippling. The global food crisis, that short-lived buzz of early 2022 immediately blamed on Putin, it's ridiculous, right? Insofar as there's a food crisis, is of long standing. It's a question of poverty and misallocation of resources in global markets. And it was already intense in 2021 as a result of the surge of prices that was going on then. And it was manifest already there that the will, as it were, to mobilize resources necessary to actually do what was needed to be done was not going to be there. And then Putin actually launches his war. And it's a shock. I mean, we don't need to go into the rationale. We could talk about it afterwards, maybe. You're all no doubt familiar with the arguments around John Mearsheimer and so on. But I just want to read this in Keynesian terms. The astonishing thing about this war is that Putin says, you know, I can actually do a war. And I can afford it. Right? Putin is not deterred by financial sanctions. That's just basically a pot of money that's sitting idle in somebody's other central bank. It doesn't dramatically affect the Russian economy in the short run to lose it. They've got the earnings from fossil fuels coming in, and they do a radical series of monetary interventions at home that stabilize the Russian financial system and enable them to prosecute the war. The war is a bad war from Russia's point of view, as we're now discovering. But the logic of that war was not constrained by finance. If we thought we were going to be able to stop him by threatening him with the most massive financial sanctions ever applied, we were totally missing the point. Right? So there was this weird, and this was always the dark side of Keynesianism, the, rise of the reason why hard-right liberals never liked Keynes was Keynes enabled, in some sense, uh, well, let me choose my words very, very carefully, Keynesian economics is one of the enabling factors in the breakout of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan in the 1930s. These were people who did not care about the financing constraint and pursued all-out rearmament on the basis of anything we can actually do, we can afford. If anyone understood that lesson, it was them. Right? So this logic of anything we can actually do, we can afford, is profoundly ambiguous in political terms. And there are reasons that liberals cling to financing constraints, because one of the things they do is you mean you don't have to actually talk about political choices. As soon as you take that away, the politics becomes bare knuckle. It becomes really tough and really difficult. And Putin has demonstrated that to us. If you're willing to just lose 350 to 400 billion in foreign exchange reserves, you can fight a war, an aggressive war. Once you do, of course, the war takes over and it acquires this incredible dynamic. 
And we should be clear, like right here, right now, as we are sitting here, in the hours that we're sitting here, the Ukrainian armed forces are closing a World War II style pocket around maybe 10 to 20,000 Russian soldiers caught at Lyman. I kid you not, watch on your Twitter feed. The Ukrainians are pincering them out and they're going to inflict a rout on that part of the Russian army as we speak. Whilst Russia is mobilizing hundreds of thousands of conscripts rattling the nuclear saber. This is going on, I mean, this Lyman thing cannot be exaggerated. By the time we finish here today, the Ukrainians may have closed that pocket. It will be one of the most significant operational successes in military history since World War II, certainly in the European zone. We are in the realm here of Clausewitz, not Keynes. We are in a world in which, if you imagine a conversation between Clausewitz and Keynes, what we could actually do depends in this circumstances not on what we could afford, but what our enemy will permit us to do and how we can navigate our way through the fog of war. Um, those two are the kind of dynamics and constraints which inhabit the world that we're in. I didn't think, suddenly I'm, I'm in my mid-50s, I thought that the prospect of live nuclear war was something that had receded from my life and disappeared. And over that weekend following the 24th of February, it came back. It came back in this really dramatic way. And it's still not off the agenda. I'm not saying it's the most likely outcome, but it's a tail risk now in a way that none of us previously contemplated. That's our reality today. And every single success that Ukraine wins presumably increases the risk of Russian escalation. We've not seen anything else. And it's not even the only war scare this year. It's not even the only war scare this year. It's not even the biggest war scare in a way. We had a bigger war scare when an American politician decided to round off her career of confronting China by making a visit to Taiwan. This is Nancy Pelosi's farewell tour of her causes of her career. Nancy Pelosi was an early, early, uh, she was down in Tiananmen Square in 1991. This is a long-standing career for her. And it's an extraordinary deviation from the world that we thought we were in in 2007. Right? This is a, a radical deviation from that. And if you want to measure quite how radical, um, uh, think about these headlines. I mean, in the, la in the last couple of weeks, there has been a hearing of Congress in which they arraigned all of the leading figures of American finance and point blank asked them to confirm that in the event of a war between the United States and China after Taiwan, they would indeed close their bank branches in China. They asked them to confirm the fact, and unsurprisingly, the bank bosses all said, yeah, of course we would. But just, but just think about this conversation for a second and how remote this is from the world that we were mapping in 2007. It's on the table, in the accounts. And if you talk to senior industrialists, I was talking to a major Latin American steel producer, and they are actively planning for the eventuality of a war with Taiwan. It's not their main scenario, but it is actively built into their business planning at this point. They have a business plan for the eventuality of not uncoupling, not soft uncoupling, not that kind of uncoupling where we slowly move back and decide to produce the new generation of Apple iPhones in India instead of China. No, war-style uncoupling. That is a very different kind of shock to the world economy than anyone that we had previously appreciated. And this isn't on the Ukraine axis. And we've seen how disruptive it is to take Russia out of its relationship to Europe. This is the heart of globalization as we know it since 1990, placed now under the contingent sign of Yes, assuming we don't end up at full-scale war over Taiwan. As a question mark continuously now in the decision-making process. I mean, this is an extraordinary reconfiguration that's happened. It started in 2020 in earnest. Those tensions between China and the United States have been brewing for a while. For me, one of the most prescient things that Larry Summers ever wrote was this extraordinary op-ed in the FT in December 19, 2018, 1918, 2018, when he imagined the thought experiment. Just imagine that China had played by absolutely every agreement it had ever made. Imagine if China had tried to fulfill every single requirement for joining the WTO, right? Do we actually think that tension between America and China would not have happened? And his answer is unambiguous, and I think very frank and very clear, no, of course not. The tension would still be there. Why? Because the rise of China as a major economy in the world disrupts America's claim to hegemony. And as Summers quite frankly says, it's very difficult to even imagine an American politics which countenances that fact. So there is a deep structural logic here that has been at work, really, I would argue, since Obama's visit to China in 2009, which went catastrophically badly. And from that moment onward, we moved forward to the pivot in 2011. And there's a good reason why Joe Biden's team has in no way moved away from the aggressive positions that Trump took, because they are the people that initiated it. Kurt Campbell is the linchpin here. The hawkish Democrat, who is a big backer of Taiwan and Japan, is the anchor in this process. 
Um, but 2020 is highly significant because at that moment, the pivot of American policy towards China coincides with the crisis inside American politics in an extraordinary way, which sets the ball going. And I think quite deliberately, the Trump people were burning bridges so as to make it quite difficult for Biden's folks to retreat. And they've shown no signs of wanting to retreat since. So we are talking here about an extraordinarily dramatic escalation on the central uh, node in the globalization system, which has come upon us incredibly rapidly from being unthinkable to literally hypothetically considering the possibility of World War III as part of your business plan. Now a reality for American corporations. They've been asked by Congress, let me try and say it again, I'm still trying to find words for this fact. Congress has asked Wall Street to include World War III as part of its scenario planning going forward. I think that's the world we're in. I mean, I'm still trying to digest this fact. I don't actually know how Ray Dalio and Bridgewater continue under these circumstances, because their entire business plan is to include China in your portfolio, because you're supposed to be able to hedge, according to their analysis, this Cold War. You're supposed to be able to take uh, positions on both sides. I'm not sure whether the politics of the moment will actually permit you to do that. America's political elite are giving notice to America's business elite of what they may actually need them to do regardless of what it costs, in other words. It's continuously riffing on this Keynesian theme. But let me come back to the other promised, as it were, big. We've had a lot about war so far. Let me come back to inflation that was promised as one of the anchors of the conversation this evening. How does inflation kick in? Well, inflation, I think, is totally organic to this conversation because if the left Keynesians, the MMT people, all of us excited folks who saw in 2020 the possibility of, as it were, a liberated and emancipated economic politics. If we were forced to admit any kind of constraint on what we were doing, it was always inflation. No one in good faith could ever resist the argument that if you expanded demand beyond the physical capacity of the economy, it would show up in inflation, and then you would need to do whatever it take to contain it. This was the MMT position all the way through, and that's the world that we suddenly find ourselves in. A huge surge. And again, the point to make is how rapidly this came on us. Really only in Q3 2021 does it become a genuinely dynamic and explosive development. It fundamentally forces us up against this what we can actually do constraint. In the supply chain bottlenecks, all of the stuff that you're amply familiar with. This is the European numbers, and they're particularly telling, because the green segment, this is European inflation, the green segment is the bit that's attributable to energy and food. So you can see here, at, at this moment, this data was done, 75% of the European inflation was coming from flat-out capacity constraints in the global system. Really remarkable. And it's really worth remembering just how shocking this is. In August 2021, so just barely more than 12 months ago, everyone proceeded to Jackson Hole and solemnly sat down and designed monetary policy for a world in which the problem was low inflation. I, can't, I mean, seriously, that was the entire conversation. The ECB and the Federal Reserve simultaneously shifted their monetary policy frameworks on the assumption that the problem was deflationary bias, and they therefore needed to do average inflation targeting or symmetrical 2% targeting, they needed to move. History demanded that they move. And I would date that perhaps as the last moment of 2007, right? This is when it really breaks, because within weeks of that decision, it's looking like a complete historical misunderstanding of where we're at. Now, I say this even as die on this hill, teams transitory, I think inflation is coming down, we're gonna get there. But there's no doubt at all that this historical conjuncture is quite, is, quite, is quite extraordinary. It's important also, I think, to insist, and I've already hinted at this, that not all inflations are the same, right? The inflation in Europe, as you could see, is a 75% supply-side cost-driven inflation. Inflation in America no longer is. Inflation in America is now driven by the adjustment of expectations, uh, the adjustment of wages. To that extent, it's much healthier. It's much healthier because wages are rising, so people aren't suffering the same losses in real income. By the same token, so it's less of a social crisis than the inflation in Europe, but by the same token, it's much more worrying for the Fed because this is now general momentum in the entire economy. And so the Fed now is doing what any central bank under those circumstances must do, which is hike interest rates. You've got it, you've got it, you've got it. No one's going to argue with it. It's broad-based. 
And it's so much so, and this is kind of the, you know, the shtick this evening, so much so that you could think, oh, right, we're, we're back in Greenspan world. We know this world. The interest, you know, inflation's going up. We should raise interest rates. It's kind of comforting right, compared to worrying about the encirclement of the Russian army by the Ukrainians or the prospect of you know, World War III in Taiwan. Let's do interest rate policy and keep focused on it. Right? This is it's kind of, it's really a nice, safe space to be in. And you know, the Europeans don't have this problem. It's a safe space to be in until you look at the treasury market. This goes back to where I was at the beginning this morning. It's a safe space to be in until you realize what stresses are imposed on highly complex, highly leveraged, very opaque fixed income markets by a rise in yields of the type we've seen. And my fear is the UK is just the beginning. And the story about the UK is not the exchange rate. The story about the UK is what's happened in the gilt market, the UK, UK bond market, and the way in which UK pensions tried to hedge out the risk, not of interest rates going up, which is all good for pensions, but the prospect of interest rates falling. But if you're sitting on a huge bunch of derivative contracts protecting you against something that isn't happening, you're in trouble. And that's what's happened there. And, and the real worry of the last couple of days, I think, has got to be that the uncertainty in the UK spreads to the US market, and the US market is the big whale. If the, if the 24 trillion US market begins to shake, we're in real trouble. And you watch, watch, watch with eagle eyes what Yellen, Powell are doing in this space, because if that begins to shake, it's a very big deal. So raising interest rates is all very well, except the fact that we're doing it against this huge backdrop of prolonged low interest rates. The bond markets have not seen anything like this before. It's a completely normal interest rate operation, except if you remember and remind yourself of the stakes in American politics right now, which is that unless the Democratic administration and the Fed can get inflation under control, the prospect is for an absolutely massive Republican victory in 2024. And so the stakes here are nothing less than the future of the American Republic. That's how high the stakes are. I'm not going to wax you know, on about the American political system. Men, everyone will be familiar with the broad outline of that crisis. But those are the stakes in the American governance system. And if the Republicans do win, don't expect the governance of the Fed to continue in the mainstream way that we managed to sustain it under Trump. The entire structure of economic governments will be in play this time around, I think it's safe to say. It's normal interest rate policy until you recognize that everyone else in the world except China and Japan are doing it at the same time. What we are actually engaged in right now, Brazil started it last year, we are now engaged in the largest, it's not the most rapid, the interest rate increase is not the biggest we ever saw, Volcker still holds the record for that, but this is the most comprehensive increase in interest rates the world economy has ever undergone. It's not even like the gold standard, because in the gold standard, you'd have some that were lowering as others went up. In this system, everyone is tightening pretty much simultaneously. We do not know whether the system can withstand this. We simply have, there's no track record, there's nothing you can go back to to show you what happens if you have this kind of comprehensive tightening. We have every reason to think that weak links will snap. We already see stressed emerging market borrowers who are being hit by a triple whammy of higher interest rates, higher dollar, and rising uh, oil and energy prices. Of course, notorious very weak links like Sri Lanka have already snapped, but Sri Lanka's idiosyncratic, you could say. Argentina's idiosyncratic. But at what point, in Elarian's phrase, do we simply have too many little fires for us to be able to contain the rampage? That is the question. We don't know, and what we do know, however, is the architecture for dealing with this, if it gets bad, is very, very weak indeed on the basis of the experience of 2020. Public goods question that I know we may want to come back to. The Fed's fight tightening is entirely normal, to keep on this rhetorical riff, unless you recognize the situation in the two largest parts of the world economy other than the United States. One is Europe, the other is China. About the United States, there are questions as to whether the Fed will be able to organize a soft landing or a hard landing. About Europe, at this point, I think any hope of a soft landing is rapidly diminishing. And quite likely the leak or sabotage of Nord Stream pipeline have delivered the coup de grace. Uh, the prices and the sense of urgency, the collapse, as you can see here in German, this is German business sentiment, is now at 0809 levels. But it's very difficult to avoid the impression that Europe is heading towards a profound crisis. Now, so far, the story on Europe is better than in the past, right? In 2008 through 15, Europe was the weak link. The largest programs the IMF has ever run, it's really staggering to think this, were for European countries. It's mind-boggling. In the age of globalization, the IMF turned back on itself on the founding members of 1944 and supplied the largest packages ever to European debtors. 
Now, I'm not saying we're going to head back there, but between 08 and 015, that was the world and how seriously the, the world, the European crisis, tore it out of joint, right? Clearly, the IMF should be focused on global challenges right now, which doesn't mean Europe. In 2020, Europe avoided, managed not to fail. In 2020, Europe strung together the next-gen EU program, a large package of borrowing that stabilized Europe in the face of the shock in 2020. The question in 2022 is whether Europe can avoid failing again. That is really the question that's on the agenda right now. And it's an urgent structural problem because of the scale of the macroeconomic packages. So this was the FT's effort to summarize the scale of um, uh, energy subsidies the Europeans were putting pl in place up to um, uh, the end of August 2022. And you can see the bottom scale is percentages of GDP. So we're talking about very large scale fiscal packages being adopted very rapidly up to August. Then came the German first package. This is before the one I told you started you with this evening. Then came Liz Truss's package, which takes you off the end of the chart. And now, if I did the German one, the German arrow would take you to the same place. The Germans are up in the 5 to 6% point. Why this matters is the Germans can put this on their national balance sheet. The British, it's not obvious they can put it on their national balance sheet. The Italians, we know, can't put it on their national balance sheet. So at that point, the question of the Eurozone's political order gets opened and the entire European can of worms blows up in our face again. And this, I think... The, uh, a couple of weeks ago, they avoided making any decisions about this. They do not want to talk about this. The question is whether they can avoid failing over this question. In the way they avoided failing in 2020, but it's a huge ask. So this is a recession with built-in political dynamics which are extremely serious. The other question, of course, is China. And I'm not going to go on at great length about China, other than to say our situation right now is entirely normal, except for the fact that the global driver of growth for the last generation is spluttering, dramatically spluttering. And the interest rate increases, the interest rate increases by the Fed are entirely normal, except for the fact that the last time the Chinese growth engine spluttered, which was 2015, 2016, the Fed decided against pushing forward with its interest rate increases. I don't think there's any prospect, given the American inflation right now, that the Fed will pay any attention. It may, on the rim, it may be able to make a case that Chinese crisis causes a shift in global conditions such that America doesn't have to act. But this is not a moment in which any kind of tacit cooperation between the Fed and the People's Bank of China is going to be welcomed by anyone. We no longer have a narrative into which that could be inserted. I'm sure behind the scenes it goes on because the technocrats know each other far too well for there to be uh, no communication. But the, pr the chances of coordination here, I think, are extremely slim. And in some senses, people may sort of chortle over this and say, well, the Chinese are finally slowed down. Great, that creates space for us. I think that's a fundamental misunderstanding of the dynamics of the global economy at this point. Schadenfreude is not what I would be mobilizing. Apart from anything else, even if your idea is somehow to contain China, as, 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 as we were heard earlier today, what is, as it were, more dangerous, a China which is self-satisfied and growing, or a China which is entirely frustrated with a failure which it can very easily blame on the West? To my mind, the latter is far more dangerous uh, than, than the former. So this ladies and gentlemen, is the world that we face. It's not, it's not a blank slide. Um, it's a world in which, it's a world in which uh, over the last 15 years, pandemic risk, both climate and, uh, uh, sorry, both anthropocenic risk, both climate and pandemic risk, have come off the pages of the hypothetical models that social scientists have been drawing since the 1970s and have completely wrecked our lives. Let's face it, Yemeni was celebrating the fact that we're all here together this evening. How, how, what world were we in in which that, couldn't, that wasn't possible? Like, what kind of a crazy experience have we just had that we've just normalized? That's part of our world. We're in a world in which there is a proxy shooting war going on between a Western coalition and Russia, which this evening is culminating in a dramatic, classic military operation with totally classic Clausewitzian dynamics. We're in a world in which serious talk with China, of a war over, with China over Taiwan is being factored into business plans at the insistence of the American Congress. We're in a war in which, a world in which the global economy is wrenched entirely out of shape by lockdowns, huge monetary and fiscal interventions, and profound structural instabilities in key elements of the global financial architecture. We are in a world in which there is serious political risk in the United States and fragmentation risk in Europe, which is, remains unaddressed. And all of these risk vectors are 
convergent, interactive, and none of them show any serious signs of abating, right? None of them do. So what we are looking at here is a series of fires. They're not even El Arian's little fires. These are big fires, which have the potential uh, to converge. And what is the question that we're asking at this moment? Is this India's moment? <laughs> that is the question, right, that I want to bring home the full import of. And as, and as uh, Menon said this morning, at lunchtime, smiling in the face of catastrophe, right? Uh, be careful what you wish for is the single takeaway of this moment. Um, I quite like the Mint's headline here. India's moment seems near but could still prove it, but I love the general disequilibrium um, as, the, as the apparently running head in the mint that captures it. But seriously, we shouldn't laugh, right? Um, is this India's moment or is it the end of the world? Um, because if you take seriously the kind of conversations going on in the United States right now, they include scenarios which include the end of the world, right? An escalating European war that goes to nuclear confrontation is the end of the world as we know it. Radical uncoupling is the end of the world as we know it. A crack up of the dollar system widely touted at the beginning of this year. I'll say more about this in a minute. These, many of these fantasies strike me as entirely unrealistic. Also the end of the world as we know it. Crisis of American hegemony in that same basket. In some ways, surely, uh, you know, my, my British sense of humor kind of appeals to me. The whole thing has a slightly Monty Python-esque aspect. I'll see if we make the next slide go. I mean, it's, it, it's almost a sardonic joke, if it were not so tragic, right, that India's moment should come against this backdrop. I mean, it's a truly disastrous configuration. Um, you must pursue the project of making India into whatever you can make India <laughs> against the backdrop of a radically destabilized and increasingly dangerous world. Right? That's just, I think, the fact that is being driven home at this point. It's a really shocking realization. And there is one domain of policy thought right now, which is current, in which this idea is, in fact, entirely native, which is climate politics. Because climate politics formulates precisely that condition, that the moment of the emerging market world, that the moment of the great population centers of Asia is coming precisely into a world which is massively destabilized by legacies that cannot be brought back. That's what numbers like this are telling you. Precisely that, that your moment arrives into a zone of, de into a world of destabilization and crisis. So what I want to do in the minutes that remain, the five to 10 minutes that remain, is to draw on the resources of thinking about climate politics, particularly from the Indian point of view, and in fact, particularly from CPR's point of view, as a way of thinking constructively about how to react to this sobering reality of India's moment being coterminous with or arriving at this moment of global crisis. Because what I want to draw on is, in fact, the, the work of uh, Navros Dubas and, and his team at CPR, who've laid out in a recent paper on India's climate policy options that I think lay out three potential paths. The first um, option, the first way of reacting to this world, I think, is to assertively claim a stake in the fossil fuel disaster, which is essentially China's strategy. Like, claim as much of the remaining global carbon budget as you can, lay out and stake that claim, say you will transition to net zero by 2060, from your already epic level of fossil fuel level development, and say this is China's due and this is what we're going to take, suck on it. That is essentially the Chinese position. And you can see why, right? It can satisfy the conventional notions of justice. Why should they not have that claim? But it's fundamentally counterproductive, it seems to me, fundamentally, because it fails to admit, and uh, Navarro's brought this up in conversation earlier today, it fails to admit India's own inescapable vulnerability, and because it forecloses alliances in the wider world if you adopt this kind of position. And it seems to me, as he, as he argued articulately uh, in the conversation earlier on, that vulnerability could in fact be the basis for a kind of solidarity with other vulnerable states and other latecomers, of which the largest, and I'm going to end on this point later on in a few minutes, is Africa, whose economic development has barely even begun and whose uh, fossil fuel options are almost entirely foreclosed by any conceivable budgeting. It could be the basis for renewed and urgent demands for action by the major emitters, the United States and Europe, but also, of course, and fundamentally now, China. The demand cannot be addressed simply to the West. It doesn't, it, from the climate justice point of view, it seems more reasonable. It's just inefficacious because it doesn't address the largest part of the problem. Plus, of course, a demand for ample funding for adaptation. 
But it seems to me, and this is the way that, that he takes the argument, is that this cannot be India's only position. Right? India is simply too big, and its own development needs are too urgent. So India has an existential interest in a third option, which is the embrace of a positive vision of energy, not of energy transition, because energy for transition is for countries that have already made a huge investment in fossil fuels, which would be China or Europe or the United States, but sustainable growth and development. In other words, building and shaping the evolution towards something new. And this template, this sort of dialectic almost of a position of radical opposition, a position of recognizing vulnerability and essential inescapable uh, 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 exposure to the problem, um, and then out of that, as it were, emerging a synthesis which points towards a more constructive resolution, a creative uh, answer to the problem, seems to me a really helpful template for thinking about options going forward more generally in dealing with this problem. So rather than climate, let's look, for instance, at the zone of the dollar, a problem afflicting all of us in this current moment. And this isn't a recent cover of The Economist. This is a cover from 2016. So this problem is recurring. And you can think of the dollar as a little bit like one of these legacy issues. No one would design the world like this. It's like a bicycle, right? It's inherently unstable. It shouldn't really work. The dollar system only really maintains because if you ride it well, it's incredibly efficient. And so that's why, as it were, it persists on. But no one would design it in that form now. But are we going to overthrow it in the way that was widely discussed at the beginning of the year? Is there going to be some sort of Indian-Chinese coalition to do away with it, with Russian backing or some option like that? Clearly not. So what then are the ways in which you can deal with vulnerability within the dollar system and change and improve its functioning? Following through on, on Navarro's logic, well, one thing you can do is build national resistance, res uh, resilience. And this is something that India has done in really rather a creative way, given the weakness of its current account. It now has ample, well-funded foreign exchange reserves, which provide it with a cushion in case of crisis. This is a lesson many people drew, of course, from the late 1990s. <coughs> you can also hope against hope triumph of the will, if you like, um, optimism of the will at least, insist on the need to adequately back global public goods. You mustn't give up on the argument in the same way as in the climate politics. At the moment of admitting vulnerability doesn't mean that you roll over, it means that you renew the demand. And in the global context with regard to the currency system, this means insisting on a financial safety net worthy of the name, properly and adequately funding of the IMF and World Bank and other bailout agencies. It also means finding coalitions of the willing. Wherever you can find them within this conflicted system and within the financial system that is most clearly exemplified by the um, swap line system, um, which has provided a network of relationships between the key central banks, which is not comprehensive, is patchy, but nevertheless provides mutual supportive relationships. And these are fragile, but you only have to look at Latin America, which doesn't have any of these other than the specific relationships between Mexico and Brazil and the United States. It has no interregional ones, as you can see on this map, to see how much more vulnerable that makes them. So finding coalitions of the willing within this hostile world is extremely important. And again, Navros Dubash's work is, is profoundly important and his entire team in finding ways of actually locating structurally how these coalitions are going to be, how you could compose them. Right? Because the idea of finding coalitions of the willing sounds great, but what you've actually got to do is find the conditions under which coalitions like that could actually, actually converge. And what he and his team at CPR have done is in a structural way mapped out in regard to climate politics, the different ways in which climate politics factors in major players in the global climate policy arena. We need maps like this for every other domain of global policy, including trade and monetary policy, that would guide India and other players in the system in finding potential allies. And they expose, as Navros was saying to me, odd affinities amongst others, um, for instance, a similarity in some ways between the climate politics of the Democratic Party, at least in the United States, and climate politics in India as well. It's low salience, you embed it, you bury it, you don't necessarily make carbon the key issue, um, and you, on that basis, begin to work forward. You can see how exceptional and unusual the Europeans are who can pursue climate policy options which just don't generalize. So this is a way, if you like, of splitting the difference between a strategy which is one size fits all, which won't work, and then anything goes, which doesn't give us any guidance at all. Let's try and structure our search for regional solutions, for team efforts that will really work. But perhaps what I really want to conclude with is an appeal to, uh, to um, uh, uh, take up this idea of turning vulnerability into a key argument. 
uh, and positioning India as a constructive, dynamic, forceful voice for the condition of vulnerability. Right? Vulnerability is the condition of most of humanity in the current moment. Poverty no longer, but vulnerability with regard to these shocks, precariousness absolutely is. And so the question is, what do we do about this? And the answer, at least at one level, is to try and, of course, mitigate, but also to continue adjusting and investing in shock absorbers, in building resilience. Um, and at one level, you could go, and I think COVID is really interesting in exposing the range of possible options here in building resilience in relation to shocks. At one end of the COVID spectrum of resilient res responses, we have China, which is a Zero COVID strategy based on massive social discipline, the reach of the party into every modern housing project, as we see quite counterproductive at this moment because they're faced with the, you know, the Omicron variant that we hatched in the West, which their vaccination program has failed to address. But its ambition is one of absolutely comprehensive control to meet the problem head on. Then there's the rest of the world. And let's just for sake of argument, take two extreme cases, which are Europe and the United States. And why I'm picking them out is let's not argue one way or the other about the efficacy of their public health programs. What I want to focus on is the socio and economic outcome of the shock. And what these data from the BIS show you is really rather remarkable. So these lines, all on the same scale, are the number of hours worked in the European and the American economies. And you can see the lines crash here in the American case, here in the European case. But you can also see the colors are completely different in these two crashing lines. And what that reflects is the diametrically opposed ways in which Europe and the United States dealt with the social fallout. Very different types, in other words, of resilience. The Europeans pioneered an extension of the welfare state, which probably only the gold-plated European welfare state could deliver, which is universal short-time working. No one became unemployed in Europe. In the COVID crisis, people were simply furloughed, kept their jobs, and were paid through the Keynesian logic of anything we can do, we can afford, played in. America, classic unemployment shock. The blue part here is unemployment. Tens of millions of people lost their jobs and were then rehired. How did American society absorb this? Well, by a mechanism that's only too familiar from the Indian case. They got money directly from the government, welfare state without the state, direct payments authorized by Congress because of America's incredibly archaic financial system, literally paper checks in the post because the Americans can't do it universally any other way. And famously, of course, some of those checks had Donald Trump's name on them. So there was a political payoff from doing this. But I'm going to say in the spirit of, uh, of, of Navros's work that the, let's bracket the Europeans as being extremely unusual. Let's bracket the Chinese as being extremely unusual. The vast majority of the world coped with the crisis of COVID that way through a huge social shock that was then absorbed by one or other form of direct support delivered by the central state to citizens in a more or less coherent way. And you can see the point that I'm driving towards, which is that India actually has a claim to be one of the pioneers of that kind of mechanism of governance and that kind of mechanism of safety net in the modern era. Now, this is, of course, the most politicized, the most highly advertised element of the modern Indian story. And in this audience, I know and I have learned over the last week how complex the arguments are over the triumph of this new Indian form of welfare. But as Yamini and I discussed repeatedly, one of the fundamental outcomes of this is that in 2020, no one starved in India. There was certainly malnutrition, there was certainly distress, but we did not see the kind of classic starvation pattern you might have expected to see. So I I'm beginning to understand how complex this system is, so I'm not going to attribute everything to the marvels of the digital age. I understand the complexity of the system that's being laid out here, at least in outline. But nevertheless, there is an important point here about the functioning of the Indian government machine not in deep state capacity, but in its ability to cushion a shock like this to a gigantic and poor society. And why that matters is because of the future. Because the question about this system, often posed in conversations I've been involved in, is, is it precocious? And the interesting thing about precocity is it implies there's a timeline that India and everyone else is on, and somehow India is ahead of where it's intending to go. I promise you, I don't think there's much expectation America will ever have a system like this. If America is the non plus ultra of where we're going, America is not likely to converge on a system like this. What is more interesting, I think, is the question of whether or not India, at the current level of income, can be a pioneer of low income welfare structures for what is, after all, going to be the great surge of the next decades in global population. 
over the next decades, we are going to see a profound divide, totally radical in human history, between populations which are rapidly slowing down after a century of rapid growth and the continuing growth of two segments of the global population, one of which is South Asia and the other, South and Southeast Asia, and the other is the enormous continent of Africa. This is something radically new under the sun. Africa has never been a densely populated continent before. Asia always has. The fundamental development question going forward over the next 20 to 30 years is how that population is provided with work and stabilized. And there's no country which has more relevant experience to that problem, I would submit, than India. And it is an ongoing search for answers. It is not a simple set of answers. But this is the laboratory for that set of questions, I would submit. And the questions are huge, of course. What does jam, let me just use it as the, as the kind of icon, like what does it actually mean, right? So one version of it is that it's a springboard for aspiration, investment, or growth. And that, of course, is you can easily see why. And it clearly works and delivers. The fear, of course, is that it's not that, right? That it's essentially a kind of spread and circuses operation on, a, on an absolutely unprecedented scale. That essentially it's bringing cheap rice and cell phones to a population which is stabilized in that condition. And that is no mean feat. And being able to ride out the global crises of the moment with that kind of mechanism in place is better than we had any, re any reason to expect in the 1970s. But the choice between those two is, is decisive, really, for the, nothing less than the future of humanity at this moment. So if that 1977 election was a unique moment in human history and democracy, this question, I think, with India at the forefront of this, is, is genuinely uh, a decisive one for at least a third of humanity going forward into the crisis that we, that we face, the crises that we face ahead. And India is the laboratory for that. Well, thank you very much for your attention this evening. I look very forward very much to the conversation. Uh, that was absolutely breathtaking and, and uh, just fantastic and lots, of, lots to think about. Um, let me first invite Mr. Suman Berry to offer his remarks uh, on, on your talk and to take the conversation forward. Um, well, Adam uh, referred to Monty Python, and many of you know the phrase, and now for something completely different. Um, um, but actually not, uh, because really it was uh, a tour de force, Adam, uh, and really some of my prepared remarks, uh, you know, were anticipated or covered by um, what you had to say. And I do want this to be a conversation. So um, two or three kickoff points, and then um, let's see where it leads under Yamini's uh, leadership. Uh, first, you ended with climate, but along the way, you did talk about nuclear. And um, your astronom astronomer royal, Lord Rees, uh, said some time ago, something that stuck in my mind, that he was dubious about whether humanity would survive the 21st century. So yes, we are very focused on, uh, on climate, but let us not also minimize uh, the nuclear risk. And so, uh, you know, um, I'm not sure quite what that means in terms of curbing the behavior of, um, of belligerents, but I think we need to be focused in a conversation or in a presentation as wide-ranging as yours on both those risks, both climate and, uh, and nuclear, because as you've indicated, the latter has suddenly become as present, or has become present once again. The clock of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists presumably has ticked over there. And so, you know, uh, the question of whether the efforts of India and others to say that don't go there whether they're, that we ought to be operating on that front as well. We're essentially uh, total nuclear disarmament rather than uh, where we are right now. So that's, that's one point. Um, the second point uh, is, is the point that you made, uh, but um, again, I think a British saying, if that's where you want to get to, I wouldn't start from here, and that, that's your message, right? But we have no choice. And, um, and so, um, I think I'm going to first riff, to use your term, on your last point, which is uh, resilience and risk management 
and philosophies towards that uh, and what that might mean and also the, the possibility of misuse and then come a little bit to the G20. I know there are going to be other sessions on this, but um, as is well, often observed, and I'm very pleased that the Brazilian ambassador is in the audience, there is this sequence of in Indonesia, India, Brazil, South Africa. So what does that collectively mean for the definition of an agenda and uh, uh, the pushback? as it were, to, frankly, a rather disappointing G G20 performance in the light of the pandemic and, and the debt crisis. So um, I think you talked of uh, 1997 as uh, an important year in Indian politics, which uh, 1977, I should say. But I would also say that, uh, you know, 2015 uh, is important in where we are now uh, for a couple of reasons. And, you know, I speak as a member of this government, but I think, uh, uh, I think the record would bear what I'm about to say, which is, um, and Sham Saran, uh, you know, who I respect enormously um, uh, and, have, uh, and owe a lot of uh, my own thinking on these issues too, um, has, uh, you know, uh, has, uh, would, would endorse this point that really what India signed up to at the Paris COP uh, under Prime Minister Modi was uh, a, a shift from its traditional position. Yeah, the traditional position was that, um, you know, what, what closer to your, uh, or Navroz's uh, kind of option one, look, it's an, uh, you people have hogged the space, and now it's, back in, it's, it's now our turn, okay? But that's not the route he chose to go. And at the same time, I think one can say that we saw the beginnings of what now has become much more uh, visible and much, which was uh, a rethinking of the role of the state in managing personal risk. So I would say that there was an appreciation that the way in which India had managed uh, risk in the past, which was essentially, uh, I, uh, perhaps not so much uh, after the 91 reforms, but it was essentially to keep, uh, to have the state, as it were, uh, keep risk away through protection, through uh, a closed economy. Uh, whereas what we have seen, and you recognize this, has been a series of interventions at scale. As you know, Land Pritchett described uh, India as a flailing state, although even he accepted that India did have the capacity to do things like pull off big national elections. But I think what we've seen, and Pratap Mehta, who used to be at CPR, first pointed this out, is that is the ability to deliver uh, social services at scale using technology. And you've picked up on that. All I'm saying is that it's much wider than just jam, much wider than just financial no, inclusion. No, and rightly so. So, you know, we've had, uh, you know, programs of um, uh, provision of LPG gas. We've had uh, a big national health insurance program. We've, of course, had financial inclusion. We've had uh, the so-called India stack and uh, the U uh, unified payments interface. Um, now, I think we're still working on the most important source of resilience, which is uh, human capital, both health and education. I don't think we've licked that. But I would just say that on the domestic side, part of the agenda has certainly been to, uh, as it were, help people cope with an uncertain future by putting in, you call them Bismarckian, Bismarckian uh, a whole set of programs in place which seem, uh, to, be, seem to be working. Um, and so I know that uh, you know, there's discussion in the West about a, uh, you know, what constitutes uh, 
a, a resilient society. Marcus Brunemeyer has done work on this. I think we should be probing what it means to be a resilient society uh, in, um, uh, at our kind of level of per capita income. I think uh, that leads me to another reflection on what you had to say, which is that the Keynes dictum uh, does it apply to emerging markets? And implicitly you said not, because you indicated that we had done the right thing through self-insurance, um, uh, through reserves. So it's not the case, I think, that we have the kind of fiscal uh, uh, space that, uh, uh, that all the rich countries did. Um, and I don't know whether it's part of what you're saying that the UK may be about to have its comeuppance. It may have fewer degrees of freedom than it than it than say the US has or than it thinks. Okay, so that's about the past. Now, um, you know, as um, was it Marx? The question is, what is to be done? Um, Lenin, right? Um, uh, uh, on the domestic side and on uh, the global side. On the domestic side. Um, you know, I, I've had interesting conversations uh, um, with, with Kelly this morning and uh, with others who are here in July. Uh, I think the reframing, which I owe to Navroz as well, of the um, decarbonization challenge as a development challenge, and as Nick Stern has argued, as an investment financing challenge. I mean, I think that's where we are going. Uh, and I think the way in which the uh, uh, U.S. inflation bill, you know, has now been touted as, uh, you know, uh, a, uh, a response to climate change indicates that, you know, it's a question of uh, each person working this out, each country working, out, uh, working this out for itself. But I'm not sure that the leadership of the multilateral institutions uh, is necessarily comfortable with that, because I think that the whole uh, you know, architecture stimulated by the Europeans, which is it's my way or the highway, and I think changing that formulation is going to be a task that uh, the emerging markets on behalf of Africa, amongst other things, you know, is it really the case you need this, that you should have the same policy on fossils for Africa that you do, you know, for a pre-Ukraine Germany? Let's not talk about what's happening right now, you know. So I think th those are issues that we need to, to push again. So I think that the development challenge is indeed, you know, what is, can, you know, those of us who are, are in a position to, think about these, can we cross our hearts and really say that decarbonization is going to have uh, largely positive uh, consequences and no, no serious consequences for, um, for uh, aspirations and living standards. But the more, you know, uh, uh, not interesting, the more urgent issue perhaps right now is what all this means now for India's G20 uh, presidency. And you've provided some uh, hints on that. I mean, I was just in the US uh, on a personal visit, but certainly I saw a huge disconnect between the think tank community, which is all revved up now to get the multilaterals to, do, to, uh, to work, work much more aggressively, and as we've seen in the recent kerfuffle um, between Al Gore and David Malpass, a great deal of reluctance uh, in the uh, MDBs themselves. So that's, I think, what I'd like the conversation to be about. What should, uh, you know, India and those who follow, and Indonesia, you know, what should be the ask for a world which has been messed up, yes, by the pandemic, but by a number of other actions which have <coughs> not exhibited the kind of solidarity that one might have expected or hoped for. So let me hand that back to Yamini at this point. Uh, 
set of comments. Um, I would be doing a huge disservice to the area I work on, which is on social welfare and resilience, if I didn't point out one dampener to, uh, to, to, <laughs> to much of what we've been speaking about, which is just simply this. India today still spends far less than any other comparative country, Brazil, China, any other country, when it comes to social protection, human capital. So if there's any foundation we need to build, first we need to find the fiscal space to start investing. Some states do better than others, but overall, as a country, we do far little. So we have a long way to go if, as you rightly have pointed out, that's the foundation for where we, uh, uh, where, where we need to begin um, and actually end in terms of responding to this world of vulnerability and multiplicity of shocks. Um, I think just keeping in mind the interests of time, um, and I know that many in the audience will have lots of questions, let's try and merge both, uh, if, if, if both of you are right with that. Um, maybe I'll t take three or four questions from the audience and then hand back to you, Adam, for responses and then to Suman. So. Um, thank you so much, Professor Tuz. Just a simple question. If we are in an era where we are seeing that I mean, the great promise of, one of the great promises of globalization was that with increasing interdependence, uh, financial measures could be able to affect certain actions by certain states over other states. So if we are in a world where that is proven to be unsuccessful and impossible, uh, the two parts of the, the question come about is, in the case of something like a Russian invasion, what becomes the countermeasure to be able to tackle something like that. And the second, in the case of something like China, if we are in that kind of a zugzwang situation of whether we don't know whether it should be contained or not contained, let's take the example of if we are to contain it, then how does that happen? If financial sanctions and financial measures do not work, as they've been seen to not work, as you mentioned, in the case of Russia, does that mean that uh, we are basically moving towards a geopolitical crisis of a far greater magnitude. So is that the inevitable world that we're moving towards then? Maybe, Adam, I can hand it back to you to respond while we wait. Oh, sorry, I, sorry, I missed you. you. You can go ahead. How does crypto come into your considering this? <laughs> 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 uh, great. Uh, great. Um, two really interesting questions and so much, so much to respond to in what Suman said as well. Um, I think what we, so I mean, to my mind, I, I, I have the great privilege of having been the, one of the team that supervised Nick Mulder, who um, teaches at Cornell and has just published this book called The Economic Weapon, which is the standout history of sanctions, and I commend it to everyone. He's been all over the world, so you can get a gist of the, the argument, say, from The Economist, um, if, if, you, if you don't have time to read the whole book. But he writes beautiful, anyway, that's a plug for my student. Um, like Nick's view, and what I learned from, from teaching him, is, is um, how much sanctions are, in a sense, a kind of um, fou de mieux, you know, given that we lack other means, kind of a logic. So uh, Putin invades Ukraine. Now, you've got two options, right? You either, you either do nothing, which is unacceptable, or you do something. So then what are your options? I mean, you could respond militarily, but that's too dangerous. So what do you do? I mean, sanctions emerge from the conclusion that you have to do something, but you can't do full-on military intervention. So instead, you reach in your toolkit and you use these pressure points. And they went, you know, we all sat and watched and we had a checklist. It was like a bingo game. And we were waiting for them to say SWIFT, and they said SWIFT. And then to everyone's general amazement, they said Central Bank, at which point I literally walked away, sat down, thought for 60 minutes and thought nuclear comes next from their side, because I agree, nuclear risk is a real risk. I've never felt so scared in my life. I was so terrified, I had to go out for a walk and wander around and whether anyone else in New York had recognized, when they, when they said the word central bank, it was clear he had to go to the next level. He had no means of responding. It's terrifying. Um, if you believe that this was going to stop Putin, you didn't understand Putin. If you thought it was going to constrain them in the short run, you don't understand this war. But in the long run, it satisfies the need to punish. It helped to stabilize the home front in the West, particularly the anti-oligarch measures. I mean, it's a really grotesque act of populism to sanction other people's oligarchs. I mean, there were, you know, there were kind of whoops of joy in Congress as they approved the removal of yachts from rich Russians. I mean, just imagine if they did the same thing. Anyway, you can take my point. Um, I mean, it's really quite insane. Um, 
But the more substantial point, and Nick makes this point too, which is that if you're engaged in economic warfare, which is what we are engaged in with Russia, let's be clear, right, is the other element, and this is, is, is supporting your ally. And the really dramatic thing that we've done is enable the Ukrainians, who, who the great surprise of this entire confrontation is the Ukrainians have resisted, right? This is the one thing that everyone assumed would not happen was that they would resist. None, no one's calculus in this makes sense if you assume the Ukrainians are going to play the way they have. And, and as we realized that they were actually going to put up a fight, we scrambled into this shocking scenario of actually then providing them with lethal weapons. And that turns out to be pivotal. And so for that, you need stocks, because you can't do this out of current production, and you need to be able to afford it. And the only people who can do that are, are the Americans. So that's key. The really crucial question, which is going to, I've been hammering on this, and it's going to get more and more urgent this winter, is whether we will back them economically as well. Because they are fighting a total war. This is World War II style, 30 to 40% of GDP. They are already inflating their way through this by printing money. They do not have the tax revenue. They cannot cut regular civilian expenditures in the way they would like. They need GDP assistance. They need uh, three to four billion dollars a month. It's peanuts in terms of Western budgets. But the EU literally went on summer holiday for six weeks before it could decide how it was going to finance this. I kid you not, they told Zelensky, we can't do this in August, Europe's on summer holiday, in the middle of his war. And it's, it's absolutely mind-boggling. So there is a failure to connect the dots. There is a program for this year. The EU is going to fund most of it. They do not have a program for next year. They haven't even begun to discuss it. So that is going to be an absolutely key issue. And I think that's the real logic. Can you back your, can you back your allies as well as punishing your, uh, your opponents? Total pivot now for something entirely different. Crypto. I mean, crypto is a, is a, is a monster. I mean, my, my line on crypto is it's the kind of bastard offspring of you know, tech libertarianism and anti-fiat money conservative conspiratorial American politics. And you put the two things together, you have this fear of sovereignty and, you know, a bunch of whiz kids who say, look, here's the solution. And then, you know, then they harness it to, I mean, you know, they harness it to extremely high polluting, low cost electricity generation. Then you literally have a doomsday machine. I mean, if you, if you were going to invent something that more clearly summarized the bewildered state of our world, it would be something like that. It would be something that migrates to wherever you've got highly subsidized coal-burning power stations to generate these tokens whose only logic really is to deprive free, autonomous, sovereign, democratic states of the right to issue currency and on the basis of that organize their monetary affairs. I mean, it's, it's truly staggering, right? And... Um, and does it work? The astonishing thing is, of course, it absolutely doesn't work. And paradoxically, <laughs> like... Paradoxically, you know, it's based on this logic of zero trust. If you read the original document, the whole thing is based on this trivial question of how you ensure small vendors on an Amazon platform against... It's a bit like the logic for the PAM, right? The corruption is the argument. Theft is the argument for the introduction of these electronic systems. Right? We can design a highly efficient transaction system that we proof against theft, as though theft was really the problem, right? So the assumption is a total lack of social trust. Like, it's this dark, anarchic view of the world, Hobbesian, really, and then you build this system that will regulate it. In fact, crypto is just a giant boys' club in which they get together in these conventions and celebrate how I've been to their parties. It's crazy. It's, it's absolutely a very, very masculine like party scene in which they all have turned themselves into rich people, and the entire thing relies on trust. It, in fact, relies on every... No, okay, let's not go there. But like, but yeah, but like, they, you buy in. So it's the reverse of what they anticipated. They thought they were building something for this anonymous world of distrust in which everyone was trying to protect themselves against theft of a tiny kind. And for this, you needed this technology. And the crypto bit is derived from NSA, cryptographic. I mean, it's crazy, right? They actually have just used NSA cryptographic technology. So straight out of the heart of the American security apparatus. And on the, I mean, they say that's fine. Anyone could do these algorithms. It just so happens the algorithms they picked up are all from the NSA. And, and then they've created a scene, which is, in other words, just like any other money. It's just like any other of these social arrangements. It, it works because everyone agrees it works, right? And so join the club. 
get off your high horse, exit your crazy libertarian fantasy world, admit that what you're engaged in is this jolly game of speculating on an asset entirely without fundamental value. And we've all done this. This is a fun thing to do. There's nothing, there's no reason why it's not immoral except the, the coal-fired power stations are atrocious and should be taxed out of existence. But that's our failure, right? They're just engaged in an antisocial practice we haven't regulated. And that's what it is. Amongst consulting adults, this funny little game they're going to play where they chase this thing up and then they bring it down and they spin all sorts of stories about it. And we should recognize it as a kind of fantasy game, money fantasy game. And, but strip away all of the pretensions to you know, be ending you know, 20th century money. And, yeah. We're very much close to the end of uh, the hour, but I will give someone a chance to ask a question. Um, okay, we'll... Uh, okay, we'll just take three, Suman, and then uh, you can respond, Adam. Okay, my question, uh, Adam, part of the G20 uh, theme, no, was, um, you know, should, uh, is it possible to curb hyper-financialization, and uh, what would that, what would that program look like? But there are others as well, but that's my question. I think we can take... Uh... Uh, good evening, uh, my, name is, my name is Shresht. Uh, the question I have is that in a country like India, how big a role do you think cooperative federalism can play in tackling through issues like this? Cooperative federalism. Center and state working oh, oh, Someone can take that. Okay. Uh, Mukta. So hi, this this is a bit out there, but you know, um, I'm sort of connecting two dots here. One, on one hand, you, uh, in the climate conversation, Adam, uh, spoke about this question of finding partners or collaborators or, you know, people with mutual interest. And I'm assuming that that, that exercise is based on interest, common interest. And on the other hand, you're talking about Europe going on holiday while, you know, deliberating on Ukraine. So there's sort of a so clear lack of empathy for, 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 I can't find better words for that. How do you reconcile this? How, I mean, is there a missing ingredient if we are looking at all of this collaboration building only through the prism of interest? Or is there something that we are missing fundamentally in this equation beyond just the calculation of interests? Thanks. And there's someone right at the back. Yeah, hi. My question is, uh, is the re-engineering or reimagination of the Bretton Woods system anywhere on the horizon? So, so maybe I can wrap together the, the first question uh, from Suman and Bretton Woods, because you know, the unacknowledged foundation for Bretton Woods is that it's created, not post-war, but in a war, um, and it's created in a, in a, at a moment when private finance was basically paralyzed by massive state intervention, right? And this goes to this question of, does the Keynesian dictum apply to an emerging market? It applies to an emerging market insofar as it's willing to apply capital controls and pursue you know, the full regulation of at least short-term capital flows, in which case you do gain a degree of sovereignty even, even as an emerging market. Um, so, so that was the notion of Bretton Woods. And, and I think, to my mind, um, there are two reasons, therefore, why a return to Bretton Woods is you know, another way, if you like, of dealing with our catastrophic, catastrophic reality. It's a, it's, a, it's a way of dealing with our catastrophic reality that I'm very sympathetic to, but also think we need to get over because it's so unrealistic. It's a little bit like the early visions of COP or a global carbon price or an idea like this. It's clearly what we would do in a world that wasn't structured the way that it actually is with the power relations the way they are and the genie of private finance totally out of the, of the bottle at this point. So I find that kind of talk about a new Bretton Woods totally question begging. It's a little bit like the fantasies about a Russian, Chinese, Indian, new currency alternative. None of these things are happening, right? So we, we don't have the time to indulge that kind of fantasy at this point. So the, the serious conversation has got to be about how we make the dollar system as it is less inequitable, less unstable, um, and less generating of massive inequalities also within the societies that harbor the major high financial centers. And there is no alternative to intelligent, earnest, serious, relentless regulation. We know what the solution is here. That's what we've got to do. Um, and we, we've got examples of how this worked. Right? The Basel process in due course made the banking system of the world proof against, in 2020, another banking crisis. I mean, and this is not rocket science. This is simply saying we need capital adequacy rules which are adequate. Triple them. 
they'll be more adequate that way, right? We went through the whole argument about this, that it, that it makes bank funding more expensive, but it also makes banks less, much less risky, so it's cheaper for them to raise finance, right? So there are arguments here, but the solution here is A, technological. There is an arms race between the sophistication of private finance and the regulation of it. And we've just this week discovered another chink in our armor. The Bank of England does not appear to have appreciated the implications of the fact that $1.5 trillion of British uh, gilts were hedged against the prospect of interest rates falling as it raised interest rates upwards and the collateral calls that would result. I mean, they didn't appear to understand this. There is literally one short piece in the Financial Times from earlier this summer by Toby Nagler, who will forever go down in history as the man who saw this coming, and is blank, zero, nothing else. And it forced them to flip policy earlier this week and embark on 75 billion pounds worth of bond buying to stabilize. That tells you how fragile our knowledge is. So we really need, I think the answer is, do we have the guts, do we have the discipline, the determination, the resolution, and also the willingness to reward people? Like, we should treat it like cybercrime, right? We should actually have blue teams, red teams, who compete with each other and should be hugely incentivized. There really isn't anything we could pay them that wouldn't be worth paying them. And we could offer huge bounties to basically out-hedge fund the hedge funds and out, outsmart the people in the investment banks. It will cost some money. It's not particularly equitable. Why not? That's what they do in cybercrime all the time, right? So that, I think, is what we need, and we should push it hard. So that doesn't, that doesn't, that's not going to kill the beast, but it will certainly contain it in rather important ways, and we should, we should, push, we should push hard for that. Um, the, the issue of federalism is a really fantastically interesting one. And one of the things I, you know, the, arriving in, in India relatively naively last weekend, uh, I have like most rapidly learned about you know, are the, the potentials and the problems of Indian federalism. And I should know about this because I wrote about the British Empire in the 1920s. And we know that federation all around was basically the model in which the most advanced thinkers of the British Empire were thinking about global organization. And I am, in the European context, a strong European federalist. And clearly, there are some interesting parallels between the structural issues of Europe and the structural India issues of India. And I don't think there is any substitute in either case. If you have the historic achievement of a complex and massive federal state, and this is one-sixth of humanity, so this is a very large step towards global organization achieved within one state, then obviously, yes, you need to be employing the powers both of the center, which has this big balance sheet, as you were saying, and thank you for that correction, that I feel mortified by it. But yeah, absolutely, you need to mobilize that big central balance sheet to be able to do the necessary, right? And this is true of Europe as well, and it needs to have that big central balance sheet. But then at some level, obviously, you need to decentralize, and there's going to be a mass of problems. And in India, decentralizing to the states isn't even very decentralized, because they're so big, right? But then you need to keep on decentralizing. And the question, both in Europe and here, is how you negotiate the cooperation between the levels. And this is a problem of architecture, which again, I think, has universal implications. I mean, genuinely universal. This is the biggest lab in which you could be having that discussion. Right? And beyond the platitudes about authoritarianism in China and democracy in India, right? that's not actually what's interesting. What's interesting is how these structures work. Um, in complex ways um, across what are obviously, and this is a huge problem for India going forward, increasingly divergent economic fortunes, right, between different pits of this giant country and how you encompass those and neutralize the strains that will result, which Europe, of course, is anguished by, um, is going to be a huge, is going to be a huge challenge. Um, so I haven't got much to, more to offer than that than to say the question is salient and has, don't think of it as a parochial question. I mean, this is what strikes me, is that the discussions that I encounter here seem to me to have huge and general significance, and not because the answers are there or because I understand what the answers are, but because the question and the conversation you're having here. And I, you know, in my defense, I think my argument is not that the Indian safety net is large enough or adequate enough or decent, or, but that the structures are so sophisticated and the experimentation is so sophisticated. And in fact, in a sense, almost even more impressive because they're done on a shoestring. Yeah. which then results in the mass exploitation of women workers who are out there in the field delivering this stuff. Like, but it's done so that the, the budget argument disappears in a sense. If India can do this on this budget, there really isn't... And there are very few countries in the world which can't do some version of this, right? Um, so I would, like, you know, flip it, uh, kind of a poor Keynesianism. Like, if they can do it with this budget, really 
anywhere in the world can do it. Yeah. Do you want to take... Uh, well, uh, ma'am, I think that, uh, as it were, the, uh, uh, the, the reframing of the issue that Adam has uh, achieved uh, is uh, uh, very inspiring. Uh, I would just make uh, two points. One is that the delivery of these resources at scale, uh, of these programs at scale, I should say, um, is proof that uh, the machinery can be made to work even in an increasingly polarized political environment. I don't have the time to go into that, but I also want to say that imposing, as it were, um, climate policy on the structure with all that that implies, uh, particularly in terms of the relocation of comparative advantage, of uh, uh, all of this is a new set of uh, challenges that certainly we in NITI are trying to think about in cooperation with uh, groups like CPR. Thank you. I think what's been so fascinating about this conversation and also the, 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 the week we spent with you, Adam, has been how much we are able to, tra to travel from the very specific parochial India questions to locating them back into the global context and vice versa. And it is important for us to remember that much of what we are grappling with today is A, not unique. The historical arc uh, reminds us that in many different contexts, at many different breaking points, the world has grappled with precisely these. Much of what we're doing in India today has huge global resonance. And therefore, as we take different steps, we also need to recognize its impact on the overarching, sort of in some senses, rules vacuum in the global order, but in another sense, an ability to genuinely shape it. Um, and, and in all of this chaos, war and inflation uh, remain the two big sort of uh, pivots on which the next the next decade I think in, uh, if, if not more are going to unfold and this is India's moment perhaps not at the best time but India really has a huge opportunity and it's for us to take it thank you thank you very much to the audience it's been an absolute privilege <laughs>